Okay, students, uh, I hope you guys are doing well. I hope you um, either have done the exam already or or or, um, or is going, are going to do the exam soon. So cause this material is not part of the first unit, which means the material that is going to be covered under exam one. So if you haven't done the exam yet, I would say stop. I would suggest to stop in this lecture and do this later. Do the exam first. It's much more important. Do the exam from the, for the first unit first, and then come back and do this lecture, this lecture series. Okay, so we're going to be starting on a new topic, um, relatively new topic. We're going to be incorporating some of the ideas that we've already had and already talked about in the other sections in this subject. But this is probably one of the most important subjects in the class. It's the one that ties together the vast majority of what we call the geosphere. Now you remember the geosphere is that sphere of the world from basically from the surface of the earth all the way to the core. And it's the part of the, the class, that, the part of this, the world that we're going to be focusing on the most in this class. So plate tectonics is probably the, what we call the unifying theme or unifying theory that actually helps us to understand the, how the wor world works. And we, it helps us understand the, why different rocks are located where they are in the world. And so we've been talking about some of the aspects of it already when we talked about igneous rocks and sedimentary rocks and stuff like that. We're going to skip, um, we're going to push off metamorphic rocks for just a little bit. We're going to be doing the after plate tectonics because it makes more sense after plate tectonics. Okay, so let's, let's start into this idea. This is a big idea. This is one of those ideas that um, uh, I purposely... Even though it was chapter two in our text, I purposely put it, moved it back because I felt you needed some better understanding of, of the different types of rocks there are, the processes involved with those rocks before we got into plate tectonics. Okay, so plate tectonics is the general idea of how the actual lithos uh, lithospheric plates or our crust on the outside, the rigid crust on the outside, is moving in relationship to other plates or other crusts. So it's how it moves back and forth. We'll talk about how that works in just a second, okay? So just realize that uh, we'll, we'll discuss the, the points of this, but let's first understand how the theory came about. The, this, this idea that, um, excuse me, this idea that um, the continents moved around is actually a fairly um, new, new idea. It's originally started back in the 1920s, but nobody really... Um, took on or, or believed it much until much later okay so most of the time people thought that the the continents were fairly static which means they didn't move okay and they stayed put over long um, and so and the mountains and the valleys and everything before that just uh, formed from other processes that we'll talk about a little bit later i talk about a little bit but not not really much because really plate tectonic theory has pretty much taken over those ideas so Back in the 1920s and, and uh, 1930s, more precisely, um, Alfred Wegener um, came up with this idea that he called continental drift. Continental drift is based off of some observations that he made. Alfred Wegener is actual, was actually a German um, scientist, and more specifically, a meteorologist. He studied how glaciers moved and how glaciers um, were uh, changed over time due to the snow, um, the snow, the weight of the snow, and move, the movement of those glaciers over time. So he looked at climates a lot and things like that. But one of the, some of the things, some of the things that he was seeing, um, or observations that he was seeing in the rocks that denoted past glaciations, also started to lead him to some conclusions about some other parts of geology. And one of these is, is he started looking at the maps of the world, and the maps of the world had this. I, Kind of fit together quite well, so he would actually put back these, this uh, the the continents and cut them out of a, a map and put it together, and actually, he noticed that they could fit really quite well in uh, together, right? Kind of like it's a puzzle piece. Also, he noticed that different climate belts um, were able, were around the world, and the rocks within those climate belts actually made sense if the the continents were put back together. The fossils made sense of the continents put together, and geological units made sense. And so let's talk about this in a little bit more. So let's first of all do the climate belts. The climate belts, if you look at the rocks, the sedimentary rocks mostly, um, around South America, North America, and Africa, 
about the age in which the, the continents were thought to have moved apart, which is about 250 million years ago, um, all the rocks were the, of the same different climates. So we had climates that were, the rocks were in this region that were, were, were um, tropical climates that, so we had rocks of that nature that uh, were forming in those kind of environments. They were forming both in North America and Africa, and the ages of those were fairly consistent. Now, something that really tipped him off, the most important thing that tipped him off, was the glacial uh, climates. So he was looking at these glaciers and seeing how glaciers were, were looked like, the, the evidence that, were, that he saw, looked like the glaciers were moving up the hill, <coughs> or from the sea level, up into the mountains. Now, that doesn't make much sense in something that would flow downhill going uphill, unless all the continents were together and there was a big ice sheet down here in Antarctica that was pushing the, uh, the glaciers towards the um, interior of these continents, which would make perfect sense that those glaciers were moving in the opposite direction. So that's one of the things that first tipped him off, and then all these other clues started tipping other things closer and closer together. Now, rock types were the same, but also mountain belts were the same. If you look at North America, you have the mountain belts on this side, have the same age of rocks as the mountain belts in Europe, in Greenland, in Africa, in parts of, I'm sorry, in, I'm sorry Northern Europe, and in, in, in Spain and those other regions. All the rock types are very similar, the rock structures are similar, and the ages of the rocks are similar. And so it's interesting that they would have those same ages right where you would fit them back together in this puzzle. Same thing for down below in Africa and South America. That there are certain rocks that were the same age as you go across it if you put the puzzle back together. So there's some pretty significant evidence that he had for this. Now other things that he saw were that fossils lined up, mostly terrestrial fossils, meaning that organisms that lived on land who only lived on certain parts of the world. Okay, So they lived in, for example, the Scythnagothus here lived in Africa South, and South America, but nowhere else in the world. And they lived right across from each other if you actually see those, those samples. Okay, whereas the Lysosaurus lived in Africa, Antarctica, and India, and also lived just in those regions. Okay? Plants were land terrestrial plants, also living in certain places. So it's kind of interesting to see that they are all connected. Now, also in the oceans, we were finding trilobites on one side that were of, of a different genus than the other side. So as they moved away from each other, the trilobites evolved differently. So the things in the North, on, on the North American side are different than the, the ones on the um, Europe side, right? And so it's kind of interesting how they, they changed over time as they go from one side to the next. Because, but they all started off with the same fossil but as you can continue to go further and further out, we had different types of fossils, which is kind of, so that it also in, uh, suggested that it was moving at some point, okay? So all this evidence was not very widely accepted at the time because they thought that all the, the continents were staying still. And, he, and the big problems with, um, with Wegener's theory or hypothesis was because of this question here. And this was based off of some of the stuff in your reading it says, why was Wegener's hypothesis not really accepted at the time he proposed it? Well, matching fossils on separate continents were common, and were, there were other hypotheses for this phenomenon. The, the phenomenon right? Now, in reality, there, was, the, there are ways that this could happen. You could have an organism that would float across the ocean, maybe on a raft, a, a branch, or something like that, and then get to another other side and then repopulate there. Plants could do the same thing, right? But that's still kind of far-fetched in some ways. It's so much easier to have the continents together and then moving back and forth. For, especially, they would be, um, they'd be different a little bit because of the change of the organism. Now, also, none of the continents appear to have a perfect fit, and that's obviously not true, right? They actually did have a fairly good fit, and any um, imperfections that we have now usually can be um, accounted for with sedimentation that's occurred on the coastline since it's... it's, it's um, extraction away from each other. Um, Wegener could not sufficiently explain the forces that moved the continents, and that's really the reason. He did not have a mechanism for it. He didn't have a mechanism for how it actually moved. He didn't know how it moved. He just knew it moved. Okay, And so that was the main reason there. Now, now the last one here was scientists did not believe his methods as a glaciologist, um, and meteorologists had merit. Well, 
some people did did think that and says, well, what is this weatherman telling us, right? And this is not, this can't be true. Some weatherman's telling us, right? It it had nothing really to do with that terribly much, but some people um, did think that. The main reason was because there was no mechanism involved. However, back in 1962, um, Harold Hess actually came out with a mechanism. Now, he actually learned about this mechanism prior to that, um, but he was, um, could because of confidentiality and um, because of some, security issues, he couldn't actually put out his theory or hypothesis to verify Alfred Wegener's theory. Now, Alfred Wegener actually died in the Antarctic, um, in, in the Arctic um, on an exploration, and he never really found out that his theory or hypothesis ever gained any merit. He actually was uh, died before it actually became, got any merit. But basically, Harold Hess was a, a a sea captain during World War II. And during World War II, he, um, prior to World War II, he was a geophysicist. Um, and I think, if I remember, he was a geophysicist in England, but he was, he was American by, um, initially American. So he came out to, um, uh, went, lit, worked in, Europe, in England at the time, and then came back and uh, signed up for the Navy here in the United States. And so what he did um, during the war is he had this transport vessel that he was a captain of, and he would get um, a sonar and put, point the sonar out just like all the other boats do, looking for the submarine so they don't get um, uh, torpedoed, right? But what he would do is he actually asked for two sonars, and they actually approved this, that he would get the other sonar and point it straight down. Okay, straight down. And by doing so, those sound waves would go to the bottom of the ocean floor, bounce back, and therefore he could actually calculate the distance to the ocean floor. And by doing so, he started mapping out the ocean floor. Now that was very important. He found out that what happened is that there was a, a ridge of these big tall mountains in the middle of the ocean. Okay, in the Atlantic Ocean and also in the Pacific Ocean. There were also even mountains underneath there, like these chains of mountains, which we call sea mounts, that look a lot like volcanoes. And so all these things that he, he, he saw, he came to a conclusion that what was happening was that magma was coming up in the subsurface, pushing a, and therefore pushing a big mountain range, or this what we call this mid-ocean ridge, up from the ocean floor, okay, and then coming out as lava, pushing out, and then slowly forcing two plates apart, okay? So what he called this, he called this idea seafloor spreading. And there were other scientists that in your text that talked about this. It was Frederick Vine and Drummond and some other people who actually helped to figure this out. Now, one of the things that some of the other people figured out is that if they did magnetics across the ocean floor, there were these um, changes in the magnetics that they could match up from one side of the mid-ocean ridge to the other side and, and date them properly, and then they knew that they were actually moving apart. So with Harold Hess's idea of, of seafloor spreading, and then Vine and Frederick's side, uh, sorry, I think it was Vine and Drummond's idea of, um, of uh, the magnetics, this idea of the seafloor spreading got merit. And that merit basically suggested that if they combine those two ideas, the ideas of continental drift, or the, the good ideas of continental drift, all the observations, and then combine it with the mechanism of seafloor spreading, now we have this, the, the modern day theory of what we call plate tectonics. So the plate, theory of tectonics is really just a theory of global tectonics in which the lithosphere, the lithospheric plates, the hard portions of the crust, right, okay, and top portions of that mantle, is divided into a number of plates that interact with one another at their boundaries, causing seismic, which is earthquakes, and tectonic activity, okay, along these boundaries. And some of that tectonic, tectonic activity includes volcanic activity, okay? So this theory was born in the 1960s because that's when he was allowed to actually publish it. Prior to that, he wasn't allowed to publish it, partly because it was during the war, and it was there and to the Cold War afterwards, that it was the, to their advantage to understand what the seafloor was so they could hide their subs and hide um, and um, other things so that they could um, battle against the, the Russian um, during the Cold Wars and then, um, then other individuals during the World War II, like um, Japan and, and, and um, German, Germany, right? So the point comes here is, is that this theory didn't come to fruition really or didn't really start getting traction 
until about the late the early 1960s. Okay, so it's a fairly new theory.